appreciate that, Tom. Uh, so uh, my name is Craig Engelbrecht, uh, Director of Remote Services Technology. Uh, it, my past life, though, this is an interesting mix of group because uh, I actually have started two businesses and sold them and been an entrepreneur and technology oriented. So I understand uh, and, and been involved in these type of organizations. And so I definitely understand uh, you know, what you guys are trying to do and what your, uh, this organization is about. So um, I was brought, uh, uh, asked to join Siemens specifically to help us think about where the future is uh, and help execute uh, and drive this. And so, uh, but these concepts I'm gonna go through today, like Tom said, it's not about Siemens, it's about where the market's going and, and just where we're at in general. And so, um, I only have about 185 slides, so if you guys bear with me, uh, three hours from now we'll be done. But, uh, no, we're, we're, we'll try to keep things going, and if I see your eyes glaze over, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll keep it moving. So, but please, if you have questions throughout the, the presentation, uh, stop me. Uh, but I also, I can get very technical and very detailed, uh, but I also don't want to lose everyone either. So uh, I'll try to stay as high level as possible, uh, but if you have more uh, deeper questions either afterwards or during the presentation, please stop. So um, we have a whole new brave world when it comes to electricity and, and uh, the energy market. And so uh, many states, as you guys know, uh, they've become, uh, they've actually sold off a lot of the generation assets. Uh, and, and so the utility companies themselves, so they're not actually in full control of end to end like they have been historically. Uh, what we also have is uh, the, uh, a lot of parts of the country have been deregulated, so open it up to be more competitive, uh, which is a very good thing in some ways. Uh, but uh, what we've also seen is because of that, uh, there's these ISOs, they call them, these other organizations that, that regulate those markets. And those ISOs, uh, because of this, uh, the wholesale pricing, how all that uh, commodity is traded, there's become more volatility in the market. And so th that does create concern, and that's some of the adverse effects of deregulation. Now, your market is not deregulated, we'll talk about that in a minute, but, but uh, in general, deregulated markets, that volatility is passed down to the consumer. And so you as the building owner, you're gonna end up taking on that volatility. And what does that typically mean? Well, what they've actually seen is from a deregulated to a regulated is increased prices. And so uh, it, it's, uh, that's some of the adverse effects that they weren't expecting when they deregulated. Uh, so <clears throat> as we look at it, there's been some issues in terms of just the grid in itself, uh, the energy market. So we saw back in uh, 2003 that the big blackout right in the Northeast affected 55 million people, uh, had a huge cost. Uh, we've also seen other things with the California crisis in 2000, 2001, uh, the Enron debacle, right, and the, the whole scandal, and it's affected us uh, in all of the energy markets <coughs> across the board. In your local market, I'm not an expert in this market, by the way, but uh, we do know you've got Rocky Mountain and uh, uh, Questar, but 2005, Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, uh, purchased uh, uh, Pacific Corp. Pacific Corp is actually, um, Rocky Mountain is owned by Pacific Corp. Uh, the interesting thing is, is even uh, Warren Buffett says an important, it's an important industry 10, 20, 50 years from now, Berkshire Hathaway hopes to expand its investments. Now, the interesting thing is Rocky Mountain is losing money, and, and Berkshire Hathaway is a, a man about making money. And so we know there'll be some sort of way he'll turn that around to make money. And some of that might be rate increases. Might be, but uh, we have to be aware of that. We're also not regulated here, right? Uh, and, uh, but uh, and prices have stayed relatively low. And so we've been able to benefit. Some of the other markets uh, in the US are the same way. But at the end of the day, that's not gonna last forever. It might become deregulated. It might not. Prices will increase at some point, guaranteed, uh, but it's a matter of how much and how, uh, how much it affects us. So 
are we thinking strategically of what that adverse effect will be to us as a building owner or as an organization that might have an impact from an energy consumption perspective? So some questions to get you guys started to think about it. Um, do you guys have a one, three, five year energy information technology strategy? Do you think forward and, and, and start thinking about what are you gonna do? How do all these pieces come together? Uh, are your stakeholders, do they have full transparency of the key performance indicators uh, of building energy data. So they all see this data and information uh, and have full transparency. Do your stakeholders also have access to the data that they need in the context that they need it? Are you satisfied with the level of, of integration, uh, satisfied with the level of, of the way systems interrupt between each other? and how applications are, are interconnected. And then, very importantly, does your IT department work strategically with your facilities group? Is your IT department heavily involved with uh, where you're going with information and specifically energy and building information? So, so today we have some issues uh, as, as uh, building owners. And some of these issues are, uh, you, you've got compliancy, uh, you have to report on some of the compliance, green energy efficiency, there's mandates, there's goals set, uh, executives are setting these goals, so you need to be able to report on it. There's also increased public pressure, so everybody wants to be more uh, uh, environmental stewards, better environmental stewards, and so they demand that for organizations today. Uh, there's also resource constraints, retiring workforce, lack of skills, uh, increased data and increased stakeholders, right? We have more information coming at us from all different ways and everybody wants access to that data. Uh, lack of actionable information though. So we've got all this data, but it isn't helping us typically to, have, to know what actions we should take, where, what should we do to make better decisions. And then we have a lack of information management strategy typically, and uh, transparency requirements are ever increasing. Everybody wants to have pure visibility into this. And so we have technology, Information is readily available, right? Uh, related to this, we went downtown Chicago the other day and we wanted to make reservations and so I Googled it right on my smartphone, uh, found it on the map so I knew where I was going and then I called them right off the map. That information is readily available, but in our business systems, most often it's not. Uh, it's available, but it might be in silos as well. Big data, storage, analyze, uh, analysis, so there's a lot of, in technology world, there's this concept of big data. So these large quantities of data, and how do we take that data, store it very efficiently, and process it very efficiently so you can provide good actionable information. Analytic software is now being deployed in buildings where the building automation world and uh, the building world is typically, and the energy world is, has been typically lacking uh, and behind the times in terms of applying newer technology. Persistent high-speed internet connection. Now, this seems irrelevant in some ways because we've had high-speed internet uh, for a while now, but when it comes to connectivity across the portfolio and to be able to have data shared and information shared across the portfolio beyond inside the building, this becomes very powerful now for how we can share data and move data. And then demanding some uh, technology, the same technology standards uh, that we have in our personal life, right? You, you carry an iPad or an iPhone and uh, we want to take that same technology into our business life that we typically have in a personal life. And all of this, uh, oh, and low cost uh, entry for uh, new, new uh, entrants because of the cost of technology. Technology is easy to, easy to, to leverage today. You can start up uh, something on Google uh, or Amazon's uh, cloud and you can start building stuff in a rapid manner. So. Uh, but all of this leads us to there's significant opportunity for, for us as building owners and portfolio owners to implement smart building solutions to be able to meet these needs. Does everybody agree with this? Does everybody? Anything we're missing here from your perspective? Nothing. All right. And the other thing is, is we, and this is just looking at from a buildings perspective, but we traditionally have a lot of different sources of data 
but they're all typically in their own silos. So we've got the automation and metering, but we've got all these other things, you know, some energy engineer, uh, when you build a new building, does a, a model of the building, you have utility bills, you go out and you do a, an audit of the building, you have project management information, uh, you have digital signage and occupant communication, sustainability and lead, you have asset management information, you have other things like uh, geospatial information systems, your GIS systems, you have your scheduling software, you have your ERP systems. So we've got all these different systems. And then on top of that, you layer on complexity of user access, network connectivity, network security, data integration. It becomes a very complex problem to solve uh, when you have to look at how to bring these together. So what we want to do is look at how do you align this and create a strategy around a smart building. And so what is a smart building? Well, let's define it. A smart building is uh, to improve the productivity of people and process by leveraging technology and actionable information to help you build, help you and your building make better decisions. Smart buildings depend on a connected network of intelligent applications to seamlessly integrate and manage core systems and devices to become smart, efficient, and sustainable. And so the key thing I want to point out though is, is people and process. This cannot be solved by technology alone. I'm going to hammer this home. I'm going to keep talking about this because so often we try to take technology today and, and apply that and think the problem is solved. And that's not the answer. It is a people and process, and you leverage the technology to enable you to do something better. So uh, if we look at then smart uh, integrated buildings and smart buildings, really it starts with integration. Uh, it starts with integrating systems. Uh, and so you can have intelligent control within your building and you can provide actionable information. Uh, then you can have system operability, so you can share data between systems, move information, and have relevant data uh, available. And then you can have uh, efficiencies, occupant satisfaction, and productivity. But it starts with the integration. You have to be able to integrate systems and move data. So if we look at then what are the building blocks, uh, if you start, and I won't go through all this, but Really, it starts down here at the bottom where you have equipment, sensors, meters. Uh, you know, it starts with that thermostat or that light switch <coughs> on the wall, taking that information, these lights, uh, the heating ventilation systems, right, your air conditioners, your furnaces, and connecting those all together. Then you, you connect those and you talk via certain protocols. They all talk via different protocols, so you have to have interoperability between those systems and have those interconnected. Then you have more of an application layer where now you can do something with that. You can start to manage it. You can uh, control things. And then on top of that, you have the, the people, uh, you have the processes, but then you also have other third-party systems, other systems that, that do other things with data where you need to share the data back to other systems. And so if we, uh, we think about it, we have different stakeholders in our organization. Uh, those people, uh, executives, they want to see a high level. They want to get a report in their email, or they want to be able to check a dashboard and see green, yellow, red, how are we doing, right? Facility professionals, they want to be able to manage the building, make sure they're on budget, be able to track information. They want to be able to control things. They want to make sure that they're taking care of the occupants, the, the organization itself. Then you have the actual business individuals. So if you're in a a hospital, you have life safety uh, individuals, they want to be able to, or, or you have the doctors themselves, the nurses, so they have to be able to manage the building uh, or uh, work within the building. And then you have your typical occupants or the visitors, the public, uh, that want to see that information. All of these people need to have access to the same data, but in different contexts for them as a user. Again, it's, the, it's, it's all about how do you present the information and how do you convert that data into the right context for those different users? Does this make sense? I'm sure there's 10 more stakeholders that we're hitting or not hitting depending on different vertical markets. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. You mentioned that this information management system is at the top of the list and then it kind of goes down from there in terms of uh, uh, monitoring all the systems within the building. I'm, looking at it from the point of view of a biggest complaint I get in my business is, uh, as a building operation is concerned, 
uh, I'm either too hot or too cold. And everybody is different, so mm -hmm. you've got all these issues. But I'm almost thinking maybe it should be the reverse. It should be turned upside down. Mm -hmm. Because when I was in college, a professor of mine, we were in sound engineering, he said, a sound system is only as good as the quality of its speakers. So you might have the best data system, but if your distribution system, the actual system that distributes the air through uh, the office is inadequate, all that quality can make up for a system that has deficiencies put in, you know, that's part of the building for absolutely. So maybe, maybe we turn it upside down and say, what kind, of system, what kind of distribution system do you currently have in the building? From this just one aspect, and then develop a system around that that can manage that and make it as efficient as it can be, given its limitations, perhaps that it, it's working under. You know, smart part of the smart building concept, and when you're getting together and either designing a facility or retrofitting a facility, that all has to be taken into account with your your A and E team. Um, you know, obviously you have a budget when you're building a facility. And ideally, you want to have individual control for every single office or every single queue so they can adjust their own environment. And you know, probably from a financial standpoint, that is absolutely impossible. So you go by standards. You go by, like, you know, we have this room sectioned off into, into cubes, a bullpen. You know, we're going to keep an even temperature of the room. Are you going to have people that are hot, some are cold? Definitely. You know, they say that uh, you can only satisfy 70% of anybody within a, in an office space or any building. You know, if they look outside and it's sunny out and it's 70 degrees uh, inside, they're nice, they're hot. But if they look outside and it's blowing and cold and it's 70 inside, they're cold. So yeah, it does come back to that. This is all layered on top of what you already have. And the point behind it is trying to make what you already have or what you're going to design to <coughs> as efficient as possible and getting that information to those who can use it effectively. So even though somebody may say they're hot or cold, You've got a way of identifying that data maybe ahead of time and, and adjusting it before it lends itself to the telephone call. You know, so is it going to be ideal? No. Are you going to satisfy everybody? Never. Um, a funny joke in the HVAC industry, and you know, specific to that industry, is that uh, um, somebody's cold or hot on a wall, and they'll take a fake thermostat, one of those brown honey wells, Stick it on the wall, it doesn't even work. And if somebody can go turn the dial, they feel better. And they the lights go away. And it's an actual fact. It actually doesn't psychologically work that way. Well, there's also another old saying. Half the people are cold, and the other half are hot. Temperature's just right. Perfect. <laughs> but if you've got a system that, that was designed for something, and now you're using it differently, Building yeah. management system is not going to solve it. Matter of right. fact, the building management system is going to cost you more money because it's going to be like fly-by-wire, these constant adjustments. Mm -hmm. You're going to go from heat to cold, heat to cold. It's not what you want. you got to look at the system. Right. And if you if you have a room that was designed to handle two people, now you got ten in it, you, you, you got to re, you got you got to put a new system in. That's the bottom line. And that's where the people and process comes in. Someone's got to be able to look yeah. at this data and be able to make a decision to say, Hey, that thermostat's behind the Coke machine, or hey, we've, we've put in a little, you know, closet full of servers, and or we put 10 people in that room where we did before. So it takes people as well as part of that process to be able to make those decisions. That's great. And we'll, I'll come back to some of that, especially for existing systems uh, as well. Uh, so at the, at, at really the, the lower level, what we have is we have all of our systems and all of our devices. And you want those integrated into an automation system where you can interconnect your HVAC system with other things like uh, uh, control systems with your, uh, with your curtains to be able to open and shut curtains based on daylighting or based on temperatures. Right? You want to be able to control your lighting based on occupancy. You want to be able to control your uh, security and access uh, along with your HVAC based on the schedule. So if I have a, a school and I've scheduled some off-hour event, if instead of having someone schedule the event and then also have to call the facility manager to be able to say, hey, can you turn that off and on, why not schedule or have it interconnected and integrated so the schedule automatically goes over to the ventilation system and turns it on, preps it up beforehand, unlocks the doors for the pathway uh, to get in, turns on the lights when it's ready. So if you can do all of that, have it all interconnected, improved occupant comfort, 
improve satisfaction of the users of the building, but also more operational efficiency, more energy efficiency. You know, one thing to keep in mind with this as we talk smart building is you gotta, you have to find and, and get that core system in. That core system is really your, your integrated automation system. Now you say, well, isn't that my BMS? Well, yes and no, it could be. Every integrated automation system can, in fact, be a BMS system, but not every BMS system can be an integrated automation system. It's a very higher level, a lot more control, a lot more precise programming, uh, more of a command control center, and the ability to integrate to multiple systems uh, across the board. So keep that in mind when you're looking at what's that core system I got to put in my building in order to accomplish all this. What you may have may work, what you may have may not. And that's going to be your limitation on top of already a limited uh, your limitations on your system that you have. So whether that be HVAC, security, fire, lighting, you know, all those limitations eventually add up. So something to keep in mind. So beyond the integrated system though, with technology today, uh, with information today and in collaboration of that information, what we really want to do is take it up to the smart building level, from an integrated building to a smart building. And a smart building really says, okay, well, if we've got our integrated system, and then we might have other systems that aren't connected to the integrated and never will be, or just haven't been able to be connected yet. For example, a Cisco router that might be reading energy consumption of all the IT network, right? Uh, we want to be able to bring that data together. We need to normalize it through some sort of middleware to be able to uh, bring it into, again, a, cent a central repository. And then we have a smart building uh, platform. And we have different deliverables within that. And I'll go through that next. But within the smart building platform, we really want to be able to make sure we're not the end all be all. That's not where the data stops. You have other systems. You might have an SAP system where you want to be able to merge your uh, sustainability data from your plants and buildings with your environmental health and safety, your product sustainability data, <coughs> your transportation and waste data. So you might have other sources or other places that that data needs to flow to. So not only is is just about doing something with the data, but also providing access for that data back out, your, out to other systems. And no matter what you're looking at between these systems, you really want some sort of common user interface for not only you, uh, but also any kind of service providers uh, and other uh, stakeholders. And you want to be able to to uh, have that common user interface through multiple sets of mediums uh, for delivery. So it might be a kiosk in the foyer, it might be a smartphone uh, app uh, for the executive, it might be a desktop or a, a mobile application that can be browsed anywhere on the web. And so you want to be able to be able to uh, have that, that data delivered to those different sets of users in the different mediums. So this, the, the smart billing deliverables We've broken it down into some six categories, but really, as we're looking at this, online and phone support, you want to drive higher performance. Uh, core control services and automation service, you want more transparency. Uh, building system analytics, you want to be able to uncover those operational issues. You want to look at, from a campus enterprise reporter, uh, reporting perspective, look at the big picture, especially if you have a, a campus or a portfolio of buildings. From an energy services perspective, you want to be able to drive efficiency. And then with the supply and demand management side, you want to drive optimal financial results from a procurement perspective. And I won't go through all these specifically, but what I want to point, point out is a couple of them. Fault detection diagnostics, I'm going to go into more in depth later, uh, but it's really about uncovering all of the operational energy issues that are happening in the building and in your organization. If we look at uh, the uh, energy services, especially if you have a lead building, uh, you not only want to identify energy conservation measures or you want to build a lead building, but you want to do measurement verification, this M and V. You want to be able to not only look at what the building was designed at or if you proposed and, and said, I'm going to retrofit all the lighting, you want to go back and monitor that and actually show what the real results are. Because what they found is most times if you don't measure the results, you're not actually getting achieving the savings that you projected. So that's key, that's very critical. And then the last is the supply and demand management is really where this whole concept of smart grid and smart buildings start to come together. 
It's where now you can have not only smart grid uh, communication to look at real-time pricing from the utility company and demand response events when you need to uh, shed some load from your energy, but it's now having a smart building to be able to take action and do things within the building in an automated way. And so that's where the two worlds come together to have intelligence from the grid, but also intelligence inside your building, and they can work in concert with each other. And there appears to be a lot of pull related data management there, but what about the push related? For example, uh, occupancy alerts. Where would that fit in there? I was in a building last night teaching an MBA course. The, the HVAC went out. I couldn't find anyone on campus at 7.30 in the evening. We had gone home. Couldn't find another room. Went to another building. HVAC went out there. Uh, so I had uh, 25 students sweating. And I either had a choice of uh, terminating the course or going down to the local pub, which we did, and finishing off there. However, we were supposed to have received emails as faculty that those buildings were actually being shut down for PM. I had no website to go to for an alert. I had no information to acquire as an occupant that something might be going wrong. I can't see that buried in there as an yeah. occupancy alert. That's a, that's a good question. That's where, again, it might be data from here, it might be data from here, but delivering that to your user in the different medium, your multiple sets of users, and, and what data needs to go to that user in the context is them as a user, in what medium, whether it's a cell phone, uh, email alert, or it's some mobile app of events that are happening, whatever it might be for that <coughs> as, a, as a type of uh, stakeholder for that organization. Where it fits into here is this online and, and support, that should be where it starts, where if there's something happens, there should be a 24-7 group that's monitoring and notifying people of the events. If there's some sort of faults happening that shouldn't be happening, those should be triggered and sent over to the online support. Again, the people and process. What, what people are there and then what process will they take? What actions will they take when they get that information? Does that help a little bit? Well, it, a bit. Still doesn't kind of integrate into the enterprise email system uh, other than your very generic uh, comments or anything. Absolutely. And again, this is where uh, I'll talk this, uh, about this at the very end, but for every organization it's different. For universities it's very different than a, a K through 12. For a university versus a hospital, it's a very different infrastructure, different systems. So for a university, if you have uh, uh, some sort of mass notification system that you want to use and leverage, it's about laying out the roadmap. What are your stakeholders? What are their goals? How do you need to, uh, what systems are being leveraged? What technologies? And then what process needs to be put in place to make that data flow and that movement of information? You know, imagine, uh, we were talking about earlier, bringing common everyday technology into our, our, uh, into our business world, the iPad, the iPhone, and various such devices like that. Now imagine if you, as an instructor on this campus, we we're getting back to those people within your facility or within your organization that are, uh, uh, need certain types of data certain amount of feedback. You know, you would be as faculty possibly the type of person that would receive information or have the ability through your iPad or computer to, when you walk into a room, you bring it on, you hit what room you're on and it brings on the lights and brings on the HVAC. Now what if they were doing PM that day? All of a sudden you hit it on, the lights come on, the HVAC doesn't and then it brings up a warning saying HVAC system is down in this facility for PM and it gives you a telephone number right away of somebody to contact on what to do. See, that's the type of interaction you're probably thinking of working for. That's, that's very possible. It's just that you're not set up for it and you need it Correct. present to. But I was just trying to figure where that fit in in your silos here. Yeah, it's all part of that information exchange uh, that Craig talked about. But it, it really comes down to, no matter what you have, the technology, you can throw all the technology at it, but if the people and processes aren't in place to, to program it, to make it happen, and to work with all the entities within their facilities, <laughs> It's not going to happen. So that's a, and that's a very valid point of uh, you know a use case of how it would be leveraged and 
and then what you would want to do, what's the people and process and technology that needs to be leveraged uh, for that particular use case for those particular stakeholders. So the technology, I'm going to spend a, a couple minutes on technology just to give you an idea of really where technology is going uh, in general. But at the bottom we have this integrated automation system, and but we also need uh, middleware. And so there's organizations like Oracle, IBM, who have middleware that's been applied to other industries and other markets. But again, it's middleware that can share data. Almost think of it as your print server on your computer. And every time you add a new printer, you don't add you don't rebuild your whole print server on your computer. You add a driver for that particular printer, right? And this is the same concept. Your middleware is that print server. And every time you need to talk to a new system, you want to talk to a mass notification system to be able to share data, you write a driver for that particular piece of uh, uh, application. And then you set the rules on what data will flow and how it will flow. Then you want some sort of uh, remote connectivity to be able to move data back and forth. And then the smart building platform, a platform as a service. And the platform as a service is it's a pretty simple concept. It's, it's the iPad, if you will. Right, the iPad was created uh, uh, several years ago, and they put it on the table and had a couple apps. But everybody kind of laughed and said, well, how is that ever going to get used? And uh, all of a sudden, some 15-year-old kid picked this thing up and wrote an app in two months instead of two weeks, or two years, or two weeks instead of two months. And all of a sudden, he's got an app that does a news reader or he's got an app that does tracks airline flights across the country and, and wow now that we've got a couple million apps this platform is pretty powerful right because of the applications on top of it but that this platform is completely business solution agnostic it has no idea how it's going to be leveraged and so that same concept whether it's a piece of of hardware like this or a bunch of software on servers is how software is being delivered because then what you can do is unlock the innovation to have apps developed on top of it rapidly by a solution provider of the platform. So Apple builds it, or the customer builds it, or another third-party service provider builds it, partners build it, whoever it might be. So think about a, a university that might want, might want to do a dorm competition. Uh, they could, you could open up that platform and they could build off of that platform their own dorm competition. Think about a pharmaceutical who says, well, I want to be able to do some compliancy reportings, uh, reports uh, for a specific uh, um, CFR 21 part 11 compliancy, whatever it might be. So then they go and use the infrastructure, the report builder, uh, the app engine, and they build their own app to be able to, to uh, satisfy that need. So unlocking that innovation and not requiring just a small group of developers like we have historically and how legacy systems have been is really where technology is going. Do you guys, does that make sense? I mean, it's a powerful concept, especially if you think in your own organization. Think about how many people innovate and come up with great ideas and great things that could be implemented, but they die right after the, uh, the idea was created because there's no way they don't know how to program or they don't know how to do something with technology. <coughs> so if you can give them that platform that either them or a lightweight developer, programmer can use and leverage, very powerful, very powerful. So that's really where technology is going and we want to be able to leverage that same thing for a smart building because a smart building, the way it's, it's uh, used today is not going to be the same thing as it will be in 10 years more technology, more uh, process, more innovative strategies will be implemented. And if we have a flexible platform, you can now be flexible as that technology or as that smart building evolves. So what we now need to do is take action on the data. And this goes back to, uh, and this is probably one of the only slides I'm going to go into specifically of what Siemens is doing, but this can be applied to any organization, any process of, of where you're at is what we're doing is creating operations centers. We call them advantage operations centers, but our plan is to uh, roll out 19 uh, operations centers across the US. And these operations centers will be specific for several state region, and they'll be staffed with a building automation technician for our world that's IT trained, that'll be watching and taking the action on what the system and the technology is telling them to do. And so we'll be able to take action uh, immediately or reach out to the customer. 
Uh, but what we also do is want to expand that to other uh, individuals, other expertise. So if you have a portfolio, you can apply the same concept, but it's not just about uh, the, the person, but it's also about the collaboration of the people working together uh, in the same room, dealing with these issues and delivering those solutions. How we would actually deliver it is, again, we have the, the data, the automation system. It's being connected through the middleware. It's being pushed up then securely to a pl uh, technology platform. You have then apps or applications on top of it that provide information. This operation center then can take action, go back into the site, whether it's a phone call or remoting in and actually taking control, or it could even be a fully automated uh, process. And then at the end of the day, you're, you're delivering a full solution, that full delivery that we talked about before. Oh. Wrong button. So let me give you a couple examples of smart building uh, just to kind of get into some real context of it. So here is uh, where we start to bridge uh, almost, it's a microgrid uh, concept where you, if you want to get to a net zero or if you want to start doing your own power generation or you want to start to become more independent from the grid, what you start to do is, let's say, put some solar panels on the roof, you have a wind turbine, you have your grid itself and electricity coming in, you might have some ice storage uh, uh, down here in the basement, you have your meters, whether it's, a, um, whether it's a, a shadow meter that you've installed, a secondary meter, or it's an automated uh, a smart meter from the utility company where you're able to collect that data every 15 minutes from the utility company. And you want to interconnect all of these so that you can have two-way communication with the utility to say, oh, well, if rates are going high today and rates are going up and I'm on a demand ratchet, then I'm going to go ahead and throttle back my energy consumption pulling from the grid and I'm going to start to consume more, or I'm going to use my geo or my uh, uh, ice storage during the day instead of which. If you guys don't know what that is, is at night it makes all the ice when energy's cheap, and then you run your water through the ice during the day, uh, and that's your cooling. And so now you use uh, basically you're shifting the generator or the load, if you will, to make that ice from the middle of the day at three o'clock to the middle of the night at three o'clock. And then you have other things that you might have, uh, you know, your, your, uh, your cars, as those become electric powered, uh, how you shed or manage a load when that becomes now uh, a variable in your system. Somebody comes in, plugs in your, their car into your building, all of a sudden your energy spikes up and then two more people plug theirs in and then it spikes up even more, one drops off, and that's just a dynamic load that's happening. And so you want to be able to manage that uh, dynamically uh, throughout the building. This type of stuff, the technology, some of the technology is being used maybe individually, the ice storage, solar, wind, obviously, very little, maybe in certain areas, New York and, and uh, California have the, the, the cars, electric cars. But at the end of the day, this is gonna become your micro grid, right? Right on your building, you're gonna have your little micro grid of generation, of power, what, how you're going to dynamically uh, shed and move things and, and uh, dynamically uh, offset things. Does this, does this make sense? This is coming, and as it becomes more feasible, as it becomes more cost effective, uh, this will be more implemented into your buildings. This is very powerful because it gives us some independence from the grid, from that instability that we talked about but also gives us ability to control our financial, right? If I'm getting charged, I'm using the same amount of energy, but I'm getting charged a higher rate because of the time of day, this allows me to, to offset that. And there's customers out there that are saving tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of dollars implementing these types of strategies. Here's some other examples of actionable information. Uh, fault detection diagnostics, simple concept is all you're doing is taking all this data out, mining it, running it in some algorithms, and be able to say, hey, I have uh, simultaneous heating and cooling. So my cooling valve and my heating valve are both open and they're running when they should not be. Right? Well, 
The first step is I have simultaneous heating and cooling. Second step is, hey, I have simultaneous heating and cooling, and the diagnostic is these are five things that possibly are wrong. Maybe the valve is leaking. Or the next step is simultaneous heating and cooling, and it is valve number seven, and you need to go fix it. The more data, the more data sufficiency you have, the better you can pinpoint that issue. Or I have simultaneous heating and cooling, it's valve seven, and it's happened 12 times with a cost of $61.20 over this last week. Or it's happened one time with a certain cost associated, potential cost. This is where it becomes powerful. If you can sit there and take your existing systems, the way they're operated, put certain parameters into the system, and have diagnostics running, mine this data, analyze this data, big data concepts, I'm now able to consume millions and millions of records, stick it into a, a platform that can crunch this data very efficiently and in split seconds, can tell you across millions of records what's wrong and what's happening, very powerful. But if we relate that then to how often it's happened and what the cost is, now you have something that you can take back to management to say, you know what? I want to invest $100,000 into this initiative, and here's how I'm going to avoid potential energy uh, consumption. This is the justification to be able to start to drive change within your organization, because you have actionable information. Here's a, a little deeper, the next layer down. I have lights on and unoccupied. It happened 45 hours across this day, and it cost me $108. That's powerful information, but it's just mining the data, presenting it, running through some algorithms, and putting either a rule of thumb or real-time pricing against that to say what the real cost is. You guys see, would this be beneficial on any of your buildings, any of your organization? Is this the type of stuff that you'd like to see? Would it help be helpful? Maybe. Uh, and, and with that information, I'm going to talk about this one more time. Your building degrades over time. You're going to have a lower performance over time, no matter what. If you just let it sit there and stand alone, you don't ever do anything with it, or you try to do things with it, but you're not actively looking at the data, it's going to degrade. If you put in software and technology, you might see some bump in savings. Where the real bump is savings is, is when you take people and you take that information that you have and you implement and correct the changes or the correct the, and, and fix the systems. A uh, good example is uh, we have a, a facility that we work with in Chicago, a very large university, very large building. They get the same report every day, every month of what problems are in the building. But they're a union shop, and so the union doesn't want to fix it, and they're too expensive, and there's all these other issues around that, and so there's no action being taken. They've corrected a few things here and there, but it's all about the people. You can get the best data in the world, the best information, but if you don't go out and fix it, it's worthless. You might as well not have spent the money and invested in it. What a drive change, right? And then you can look at advanced control strategies. How do I modify that system in real time? We went back to that smart building there that had the solar and the wind and the electric car. You're gonna dynamically change the building based on what's happening on the utility, what's happening inside the building in real time at that moment. And then you go and upgrade your equipment. You change out your boiler, you change out your whatever it might be and you make a, a higher efficiency equipment upgrade. So what do we do? It's all great, but we need to think about a roadmap. Where do we go from here? And so at the end of the day, if you have, whether it's a single building or a portfolio building, you have low data or high data sufficiency, and you have only a few sensors, or you have a lot of information, uh, it can provide you a roadmap to be able to say, well, if I have a single building with low data 
That means I might need to think about an integrated automation system. I need to fill in with min missing sensors or meters. Talk to your utility company. There's probably some rebates and, and programs for them to help pay for some of this equipment upgrade. Uh, but you want to start to baseline your building to be able to say, where am I at now? So that when you actually do implement changes, what was the actual uh, uh, differential? And if I have a portfolio, but I have a little bit of data, I can start to do benchmarking to say, hey, which building should I attack first? Where's the biggest problems? What's my portfolio strategy? What other sensors and meters uh, need to be replaced? And then the more data you have, the more operational process you can start to get into. How can I affect that, that operational process, that sequence of operations, that control strategy? Uh, how can I go and implement energy conservation measures or uh, facility improvement measures and do measurement verification and actually track to see if I've hit the results that I've projected. Here's an example then of saying, okay, if we want to lay out a roadmap, what, how do we do that? Well, you start with some technology, process, and people, and you put the, put the pieces together. What technologies do you have? What technologies need to be integrated? And then, depending on your use case, I want to be notified as a, a professor and a student that the ventilation system was shut down for preventive maintenance. That's a use case. Well, what people need to be involved? What's the process? How does that information flow? Who takes what? You know, who gets what information? And what technology is actually used and leveraged? So you just lay out this roadmap and then you present that back to your management and you use the data and information to help justify the investment. And now you're, you've got your strategy. You put that in place to say, here's what we're gonna do next year, three years from now, five years from now. Does that make sense? Last thing uh, I just want to touch on is uh, we all are busy, very busy. We don't need more tasks to do. Uh, the other thing is, is we all provide some level of service to someone. And what we really want to do is not just do a bunch of tasks, is we really want to be able to understand what our needs are of our customer. <coughs> we want to drive whatever we do for them as that delivery. And we want to make sure that we demonstrate the value and have it value-oriented, outcome-based, not task-oriented. Because we can come up with a bunch of tasks, but that doesn't mean anything. If you turn it over and flip it over upside down to say, what value does this mean to a student and a professor to know them when that, that building shut down or to know when a, a laboratory is about ready to uh, uh, be audited? And, and what's the value if you don't? If I don't have the compliance reporting done, we lose our uh, uh, Medicare or Medicaid funding, and it's going to cost us $1.5 million, whatever it might be. And that's where you got to start to demonstrate the value and make this outcomes based. Whatever you do. Does that make sense? So as we look at the people, process, and technology and develop a roadmap, we need to keep this in focus and say, what, what are we really trying to achieve? And what's the value to whoever we're doing this for? Questions? <clears throat> Was that helpful? Did I go not deep enough? Too deep? Sounds like I didn't hit some use cases uh, to maybe put some. Well, I'm, I'm not being critical of oh, no, that's fine. what you were saying. I was just trying to picture yeah. where the occupancy services are. Okay, yeah. What's usually the payback period? It all depends on what you're trying to do. And it depends on what you bundle together or unbundle. Technology itself, and infrastructure, costs a lot of money. But when you put certain strategies together, you can find a, a relatively low payback. You know, two years, could be six months, depends on if you high intensity user uh, energy consumption. Depends on if you have low utility rates, high utility rates, a lot of different factors would go into it. Uh, some of it might be 10 year payback, uh, but it's all too on what your management is willing to, to take and bite off. Some things they want to be aggressive, some things they're willing to, to use maybe more as a marketing PR. Right? Wind and solar, rarely a low payback, but you might do it just for demonstration purposes. 
you see customers um, quantifying additional benefits besides just energy as part of a payback long term right now? Because as things moved along, when we've got technology changing by day, and you know we've got aging technology, old technology systems, and there's like you just presented, there's a lot of additional benefits to the users, the operators. Absolutely. Uh, rarely do we see, if it's not quantifiable and direct, you might put some intangibles in there, but rarely do you see, uh, especially when it gets to a CFO or whoever's making that financial decision, if you say, well, this is going to improve our productivity, unless you've got some good data behind that, uh, that can be measured and quantified, uh, it probably will not be taken at face value. And so that might be a side benefit to say, okay, well, we've got marginal energy efficiency, but we've got these two or three other things that factor in that we know is unquantifiable, but will have an impact, then that might be taken into effect. But it usually has to be some sort of solid return on investment, solid uh, uh, payback. Why don't we take one more question as we're wrapping up uh, the evaluation sheet, the green sheet. If you just give us some feedback for the presenters at UTC, make these even better. But it was a great, great session. And then we'll do a quick drawing and absolutely. Any other uh, questions for, one more question for Craig. Maybe that's, that's it, great. Well, thank you very much.